the conservative working man has always been a really important feature of the Conservative Party. Dad was a Tory of the old school, the independent working man who believed in standing on his own feet. First, I'm a Conservative. Second, I'm a trade unionist. Third, I'm a free man and I wish to remain so. As a politician, I was one with whom a lot of those people could feel more comfortable. He's got very much more to lose by bad government than a rich man who's cushioned against it by his wealth. Who ever heard of a working class Tory? You might think such a person will be a walking contradiction. Maybe so. But you're listening to one right now. One fine day in 1968, I walked from working class Battersea in South London across Chelsea Bridge and joined the Kensington and Chelsea Conservative Association. Ever since the birth of mass democracy in Britain, millions of working class people have thought of themselves as Tories. And without them, as the historian Ross McKibben points out, the Conservative Party would long since have sunk into the history books. It's been calculated that about half working class voters voted Conservative before 1914. And without that half, the Conservatives would have been in tremendous difficulty. I would say it's probably a good half of the Tory vote before 1914. Why would any member of the working classes spurn Labour and vote for a party of old Etonian land-owning toffs? Well, according to sociologists, for one of two reasons. They tend to divide working-class Tories into two groups. Some were deferential, others were aspirational. Let's have a listen to an interview with a woman who was born into a working-class family in the Midlands in 1906, who left school at 13 and became a Tory in her early 20s. This is Edith Pitt, recorded in 1963. We soon found ourselves swept into all the voluntary work that's done. We canvassed, not knowing a great deal about politics, I must confess. We delivered leaflets hot from the printers, getting the printer's ink on your fingers. We disturbed courting couples in the doorways as we were delivering. It is uh, uh, certainly a little curious that a, a girl in your situation at that time, from a working man's home, very hard up perhaps, and unemployment, and great difficulties and hardships, that you turned not left, as so many young people might have done in those circumstances, but you went right. No, I'm jolly glad that it didn't leave me with any bitterness. The tough upbringing that I had and the hardships, and it wasn't all hardships, you know, I was very happy being a member of a big family, meant that uh, I was conscious of the needs of others, but I had this very strong feeling of wanting them to earn them for themselves, not giving them everything on a plate. So Tories, like Edith Pitt, thought Conservative governments would help them and their children to better themselves. Many see this as more rational than being deferential, a word that suggests a forelock tugging peasantry voting for their rulers. Yet deference seems to have been much more common. Take the case of Harold Macmillan, an aristocratic Tory who became MP for the impoverished Teesside seat of Stockton. Broadly, when I went to Stockton in 1923, the middle class was liberal. The few richer people were conservative, and we drew our vote from the working class, from the houses built around the works. They were Tory. That was the old pattern. And come election time, Macmillan had a trump card. His wife, Lady Dorothy, took Tory supporters on outings to her family's ducal estate, Chatsworth. Here's the son of one of them, George Winpenny. His Grace, the Duke and Duchess, of course, were there to greet them. And, of course, it was home to Lady Dorothy. This is a photograph of Lady Dorothy winning the egg and the spoon race. Oh, she was a marvellous sport. That's Lady Dorothy. That's my mother, Mrs Winpenny. It's easy to dismiss as dupes such poverty-stricken people voting Macmillan in in the depths of the Depression. But I wonder if this deference was actually perfectly rational. I s suspect it's bit more than deference. It is the sort of place where, by Harold Macmillan's time, Conservatives would have been saying, look, we're in a period of economic depression, tariffs are relevant now. So, clear self-interest argument? I think clear so. Clear economic argument, clear understanding of what they're, what they're doing here. This is, this is not just an emotional, traditional vote, is it? It's, uh... it's very difficult to separate these things, isn't yeah. it? Because, of course, 
when Harold Macmillan was standing in the 20s and, and 30s, there's still an enormous amount of popular interest in the empire. But basically, a lot of those issues that had sustained the Victorian pattern, yeah. I think, are now losing their influence. So Harold Macmillan's experience was not atypical in that sense, pretty not. normal for the time. Oh, yes, yes. We have to turn to work to win the peace as we've won the war. After the Second World War, the Tories' safe pair of hands pitch seemed out of time as Clement Attlee led Labour to a landslide victory. We'll build a world of freedom, democracy, peace and social justice. As the Conservatives' leader, Churchill felt they had to do as his dad had done and get the workers back on side. His man for the job was Lord Walton, a Salford Sadler's son turned social scientist, businessman and now party chairman. I knew that if we were to gain the responsibility for government of this country, the party would have to be revitalised as a broad-based democratic party, embracing all sections of society. And uh, its inspiration, the praise Tory democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, we have made that phrase into a reality. Churchill actually, as Prime Minister after 1951, in most ways upheld the consensus politics of the Attlee period. An important part of that was that the party must not get into conflict with the trade unions. As Martin Pugh explains, one way to show trade unionists that the Tories were their friends was to get one onto the Conservative benches and the Commons. But who? Step forward, an electrician from rugby, Ray Morby. Ray Morby fits into this wider strategy. Clearly, Lord Walton, the party chairman, took a hand in trying to get a constituency party to adopt him. But even Walton did have to press very hard. The local party in Totnes in Devon evidently were not altogether happy. And that's why he drew Churchill in. Let's have a listen to it. The party political broadcast he gave the BBC during the election campaign in 59. Tories were clearly trying to win over working class support. At the moment, shop stewards are pretty unpopular chaps. I was a shop steward for several years in a large factory in the Midlands, and I know that they have a very important part to play in modern industry, which many are doing with credit. It is the activities of a small number that is causing concern and distress. Don't run away with the idea that all trade unionists are socialists. Far from it. At least three million of us vote Conservative. Let me tell you why. They obviously saw him as useful to the cause and used him accordingly. That being said, he hardly had any career at all, did he? That's true. I mean, he was appointed to a junior post in the Postmaster General's office, 1963, gave him about 18 months yeah. until the 64 election. The party's strategy had already worked, and it was proven at the 1955 election when the party won with a bigger majority. So I rather think this took a bit of the momentum out of the strategy. He just ceased to be useful? I fear so. Was that it? Could no working-class Tory do any better? Well, let's go back to Edith Pitt. We last glimpsed her briskly handing out Conservative election leaflets to courting couples in the doorways of Depression era at Birmingham. What happened to her? I asked Juliet Gardner. She became a councillor and a very successful councillor and then, of course, she became a Conservative Member of Parliament. She does sound, you know, very middle class when you hear her talk. And when she talks about the prejudice she encounters, she doesn't talk about the prejudice against her class at all. She talk, Within the Conservative Party, she talks only about the difficulties of being a woman in Parliament. Edgbaston met to choose a candidate, as I understand it, and remember I wasn't a spectator, my name was suggested, everybody was happy about it, but the chairman thought they should go through the motions. The rules said that they should see other candidates, they did so. They settled on two, a man and myself, to choose between, and the executive committee chose the man. So that was that. I didn't weep, I promise you. Uh, I've had so many ups and downs in politics that I've learnt to bounce, I well, think. Well, for the moment you were out, now how did uh, you get back in again? Well, this was a jolly good thing for the Conservative Party because the executive, having made this choice on a Monday, Thursday of the same week, they had a meeting to which every subscriber in the party was invited. 600 people turned up instead of the odd 70 or 80 who normally bother to go to a formal meeting like that. 
the majority of them said, we want Edith Pitt, and they got Edith Pitt. Once Edith Pitt got to Parliament, what sort of MP was she? Oh, she was a very active MP, and in fact she bounced, in her words, to um, become Under Secretary at Pensions and then later at Health. And she did very much take up the sort of issues which would have concerned her working-class constituents, you know, things like housing and health. Successful ministerial career, I guess. Yes, yeah. until, of course, she was sacked in 1962 in the Great Night of the Long Knives, which Harold Macmillan reshuffled her. And was her attitude to the poor tougher or more gentle, given her own experience, do you think? It seems to me that, you know, she certainly understood working class issues. She believed in independence and people, you know, making their own way and all this sort of thing. But I think generally on the working class, she understood the difficulties. Mm. She understood the necessity, perhaps, for council housing. I ask because in modern times, some people tend to see sort of working class conservatives as quite hard edged. Whereas, actually, well, by the looks of it, she's uh, an understanding, yes. interested and effective minister. And effective minister, yes, exactly. Be... No, no, Billericke man was not coursing through the veins <laughs> of um, <laughs> Edith Pitt. <laughs> How were her working-class credentials put to use by the party? Oh, the party were very proud of her working-class credentials. So far, so respectable. These showcase working-class Tories were clearly not going to rock the boat. The next generation, though, was a little different. In 1945, amidst the celebration of Labour's landslide victory, a working-class teenager from Ponder's End, just north of London, begged to differ. His name was Norman Tebbit. If you were born, as I was, in 31, in the aftermath of the... grew up in the aftermath of the Depression, you went through the war, and by the end of the war you were asking yourself, shouldn't there be a better way of organising things than this? And then I was an instinctive individualist an anti-collectivist. I wouldn't join things. And uh, I had the good fortune to be taught history by a brilliant history teacher who taught the history of Europe. 1830 to 1914 was the key. And out of it, I became a Conservative. I stood as a Conservative candidate in the form elections in 1945 and was defeated. The only time I've ever been defeated in an election. <laughs> And as soon as I was 15, in 1946, I joined the Young Conservatives. During this election, I've travelled right through the country. The government that Ray Morby and Edith Pitt both served in was led by Harold Macmillan, who we last saw amid the adoring poor of 30s Teesside. What has struck me throughout is how buoyant everybody is. Everyone feels that Britain is in top four. The post-war world was changing fast and Prime Minister Macmillan was now racing to catch up with a new kind of working-class Tory. I asked the historian Dominic Sandbrook who these people were. They overwhelmingly lived in the Midlands and the south of England. They lived in new towns and new suburbs and housing estates. We only had two rooms in Bethnal Green, you know, no convenience. We shared the sink with five families. When we come to view this place, we uh, got out of the station. The first thing that struck me most of all was Cleanness. Everything was clean and open. First time I ever saw this one of these houses at all. Oh, heaven, paradise. <laughs> They're often young, proud of their working class roots, but saw themselves as the kind of people who would soon be owning cars, living in their own home. They want their children to do better than they did and to kind of move on, to move out of the streets, to go to university, all those yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. And often I think those people think that the Labour Party and the trade unions are kind of keeping them down a little bit or are patronising them. And so they like the Tory so it, rhetoric of opportunity. It, it, how did they as associate themselves in their voting with someone like Harold Macmillan, who was the sort of opposite of that? He started yeah. the top. Yeah, it's an amazing thing, because Macmillan is this kind of grouse more stereotype, isn't yeah. he? And he actually plays up to that. But at the same time, the Tory party was very clever in projecting itself in all sorts of other ways, with posters and with advertising, as the party of affluence. Mrs Darby, mother of five children and part-time skilled worker in the textile industry. She's a trade union member and an active Conservative. This is a sequence that shows three posters from a 1957 ad campaign run by the Tories. It's a series of faces, each captioned, you're looking at a Conservative. Bill Keith. He's an engineering examiner, president of his union branch and an active Conservative speaker. Charles Bowden, 32. He's a timber yard salesman, married with two children. The Tories are the future in 59. Macmillan is always sending his colleagues things saying, we must be a modern progressive party. Really? Yeah, because we think of him as so like a dinosaur, and yet he was a moderniser. 
<laughs> An old Etonian modernizer now, where did that come from? <laughs> Macmillan's mix of modernizing aspiration and maintenance with trade unionists was a hit. But looking on from the wings, there was one young working class Tory who thought he'd spotted a pretty big flaw in the show. The overmanning in industry, which was crippling our industry as against the Germans and others, he wouldn't tackle because that meant tackling the trades unions. And essentially he saw a compact with the unions and management, which was the same concept as Mussolini had of the corporate state. Essentially, he was, he was a corporatist rather than an individualist. But nevertheless, he had an appeal, didn't he? He had an appeal oh, in the 50s yes, in, in, in terms of the affluent society, yes. the idea of Tories as giving people the opportunity to make their way and enjoy themselves. Yes, you know? yes. The problem was that it didn't work because he wasn't willing to make the economic reforms which were necessary to do it. So there were tensions waiting to surface. In 1963, the posh moderniser Harold Macmillan was replaced by Alec Douglas Hume, who was certainly posh, but could never have been accused of being a moderniser. He promptly lost the 1964 general election. The Tory party suddenly seemed to have gone from being the party of the future to the party of the past. Labour is the modern party, white heat of the technological revolution. Had Labour discovered aspiration? Yes, absolutely. And that worked with the working class voter? Yes, definitely. The kind of people, I think, who vote Labour in 64, they are precisely the Macmillan Tories of 59. So where did that leave those working-class voters who stayed loyal? The TV scriptwriters Ray Galton and Alan Simpson thought they knew. In their sitcom Steptoe and Son, Harold mercilessly lampoons his father's politics particularly in this episode from 1965, called My Old Man's a Tory. I don't try and tell me why I think the way I do. I've been a Tory ever since I left school. A tight, wasn't it? <laughs> I used to poke you up the chimneys, didn't I? <laughs> no, they didn't. And I didn't, didn't leave school till I was ten. Oh, what beauty and joy. The richest empire the world has ever seen, benevolently bestowing its largesse on a flower of its youth. Compulsory education to the age of 10. The mind boggles. I think that's a classic product of the 60s, where you have the Tories seen as the backward party. You know, the only reason a working class person could vote Tory is out of pure deference. That's how Albert is portrayed there, isn't yeah. he? He's uh, meant to have been born in 1899. He's kind of a really backward looking character. It is funny, it's funny on all sorts of levels, but the butt of it really is the Tory. Really, Father, I've failed to understand people like you. You ain't got two items to scrub together and it goes running around shouting hands off the stock exchange! Well, let me tell you this, mate. If you let any of that lot in on our council, you need your brains tested. Five minutes after they finish counting the votes, the rates will go up. You mark my word. Many working men voted Tory precisely because it wasn't run by the middle classes. Mm. It was run by people who could hold a balance, who were fair-minded, who would work in the national interest and not for particular kind of sectarian causes. In another of the great sitcoms of the mid-60s, Johnny Spate's Till Death Us Depart, this attitude is noisily championed by another famous working-class Tory of the old school, Alf Garnett. They ain't got nothing of their own, eh, them Labourites? They ain't got no private fortunes? Not like us Tories, eh? Fortunes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i never seen any of it. Hey, listen, uh, we'll only get their private fortunes anyway. Well, I'm using get... this, mate, but using the old loaf. That's how they got it, and that's how they're going to hang on to it and all. And Alf's attitude there to the Tories, which is the Tories are the party of, you know, the nation of patriotism. They're the rich man's party, fine, but the rich men know what's good for the country. The rich men have got money for a reason. That sort of Toryism, people who sort of subscribe, I think, to that creed are adrift, I guess. Is that the sort of general culture of the 60s, that Tories, working-class Tories are somehow deviant or deluded in some way? Yeah. At odds with uh, yeah. their environment? Absolutely. I think the portrayal of Alf that you get there and the portrayal of Albert Steptoe, both of them, you know, old-fashioned kind of names, Alfred and Albert, their Toryism in the sitcoms is, is comic. But for all the persistence of deference, whatever view you take of it, it kept morphing into aspiration. Philip Collins was chief speechwriter for Tony Blair, but in the years after the war, his grandfather was a classic working-class Lancashire Tory. My grandfather began as the office boy 
in the mill in just north of Manchester and quite quickly started to do well. Not not formally educated, but very smart. Started to do very well for himself in there. Came to the attention of the mill owner, who was at that time, in almost, it's almost I can't believe I'm saying it, he was a Tory MP for the town. And my grand, he became my grandfather's patron at work, and he ended up as the foreman of the mill. And for him, to be a Conservative was to display the fact that you were getting on. So it, was, it began in, with deference, but it ended up with a sort of aspiration. In the end, the aristocratic Alec Douglas Hume resigned to be replaced by a very different sort of Tory, the meritocratic Edward Heath. Ladies and gentlemen, you all understand that this is a very proud and a very exciting day for me. This was a huge change. But as it turned out, picking the party's first ever working class leader didn't solve everything. Just listen to Heath's voice. I've been a member of the Conservative Party for 30 years since I was a student. And today the party in the House of Commons has elected me as their leader. Heath, working class, Kentish background. His father is a carpenter who becomes a kind of um, very successful joiner and builder. His mother was a lady's maid. He but, could but, only go to Oxford with the scholarship. But didn't Heath jump right out of that and sort of change himself? Yeah, when Heath goes up to Oxford, he is very conscious that he's an outsider. That's why I think he has this bizarre voice. I think this is a voice born of insecurity. I think this is somebody who's had a Kentish accent. He's gone to Oxford, he's hanging around with all these Charles Hours, Westminster, Eton boys, and he thinks, oh, I want to be like them. And on Monday morning, I go before the representatives of the whole party in both houses of parliament and the country for election. How did working class Tory voters respond to having a working class Tory leader? Not everyone was happy. <laughs> No, yeah, anyway. more's the pity. Oh. The grammar school Twitter oh. got up there now. So till death us do part suggested that deference to education and wealth was still in rude health. In this respect, the sitcom is backed up by some statistics. In 1967, the sociologist Eric Nordlinger conducted a detailed survey of working-class Tory attitudes, dividing them in the familiar way into deferentials and what he called pragmatists. We've got here the Peer's son versus the Clark's son right, yeah. as, as alternative leaders for them. I mean, Heath is the Clark's son in this context. Absolutely, yeah. And it's quite clear they do not like the... No, they yeah. think clearly that he doesn't have the education, yeah. that he doesn't have the social connections, the wider experience. The Peer's son is more likely to have all the skills that you need to succeed as a leader. So there is a, clearly a culture... But they know of, how to run the country. Yeah, of a culture of deference. Somebody is... Somebody is born to this, knows how to run the country yeah. in some way. And this is 67, so Ted Heath is the leader, and this is basically what Ted Heath is contending with. And we've also got Eaton Man versus the Grammar School Man. But this is Alf, isn't it? He doesn't trust... <laughs> Alf Garnett doesn't trust Ted Heath. This is Harold Macmillan versus Ted Heath in a nutshell. And again, the same thing. Yeah, yeah. extraordinary. Extraordinary that almost 30%, 28% of these so-called Tory pragmatists mm. would prefer an Eaton Man to a Grammar School Man. And what's more, what I find almost unbelievable... 26% of Labour voters would prefer the guy from Eton. Although it was the time of great social mobility, it was the time probably when it was the easiest to get on in, in British history. The working class in this context still take the view, actually, the Eton man will do better. I think that is a result of a society in which trust generally is much higher. And for that reason, people are much more likely to defer... So Enoch Powell and Heath and Morgan and Hogg, they're all idiots as well, are they? Yeah, I didn't go as far as to say that. They are intelligent men. They are misguided. They've read the wrong books, that is all. Oh, well, that's them scrubbed out, isn't it? The minute the word goes round Westminster that Harold Steptoe's given them the thumbs down, they're out there. That's... This deference, as caricatured in Step to and Son, was an acceptance of the existing order of things, a belief that what we have is better than most of the alternatives. I witnessed this firsthand as a boy. My stepfather, a Labour voting union shop steward, used occasionally to have good natured political arguments with one of our South London neighbours, a Tory voting totter, a rag and bone man. Nobody could have been less pretentious than this man. By nature and calling, pretty scruffy, there were no airs and graces about him. He was soft spoken but hard headed, rather the opposite of Albert Steptoe or Arth Garnet. My memory of those arguments was that whilst my Labour stepfather won the occasional moral point, our neighbour won all the practical points. 
He had an understanding of the way society worked that informed all his views. He was happy with his lowly place in society. But unlike Albert, he scrimped and saved to send his intelligent son to public school. What came next was a resurrection of an old alliance between the aspirant working class and the unfashionable, striving lower middle class in the person of Margaret Thatcher. And the new working class Tory in power was personified by Norman Tebbit. I know those problems. I grew up in the 30s with an unemployed father. He didn't riot. He got on his bike and looked for work, and he kept looking till he found it. Tebbit was vilified by the metropolitan elite, but fated by working-class Tories, largely because they thought that that same metropolitan elite had long ago lost the plot, failing to understand the real lives of real working families. This tension was reflected inside the Tory party. Back when Tebbit Sr was on his bike amid the mass unemployment of the 30s, Harold Macmillan's relationship with deferential Tory working men and women could hardly have been warmer. But how did he react to seeing such people in power? I know Macmillan famously observed of me when I first became a minister in 79 that he'd been down to the House of Commons and heard some fellow with a Cockney accent. They told me he was a minister. <laughs> what did you make of that? Well, first of all, he couldn't recognise a Cockney accent because I don't have one. So perhaps, to some, deferential working-class Tories were preferable to aspirational ones. Mr Terry, can I ask you what you, you would regard as the most important of the measures you've introduced today? I think the measures to improve the position of people who are um, affected by the worst features of the closed shop are important. Tebbit's uh, trade union law provoked Terry's much opposition. But when I asked him how the Thatcher government won over working-class Essex man to the Tories, he cited three issues. Council house sales, yeah. the prospect of lower taxes and, astoundingly, trade union law reform. I recollect going out in the um, 83 election with a BBC television crew in Chinkford and um, we went canvassing in an area which astounded them that I should have chosen it. I knew what I was doing. And uh, I think about the third house, the door was opened by a youngish woman. And as I was saying who I was, uh, along the passageway came a chap, big, burly, young chap, wearing a singlet, tattooed arms, who pushed her aside, advanced towards me, clasped me by the hand and shook it and he said thanks mate I don't have to go out on strike every week anymore <laughs> I'm in the water industry and I'm just off with it <laughs> Elsewhere some working class Tories were less happy I'm now working as a decorator in the construction industry which is quite a come down This is from an edition of Panorama in 1981 about voters who were Labour in 1974 Tory for the first time in 1979 but who are now disgruntled has it affected your, your standard of living? Yeah. Very much Quite so, a lot. yes. Very yeah. much so. Well, what, have, what have you cut out? What's changed? Nights out. Nights out. Yeah. Um, um, the house for another thing. We, yeah, we don't, yeah. To be honest, we don't know if we can stay in this house. We don't know if we can afford the mortgage. We're yeah. hoping, uh, if he works very hard, that, that we can keep up the payments, but we have become in arrears with the payments, unfortunately, okay, which, which was inevitable. Right. I'm not ashamed to say it, sorry. Do you feel that, that your own troubles have been caused by the government? Completely, utterly and categorically, yes. Partly. Yeah. Because, <laughs> well, I think so. Be, I think so because if they hadn't been caused by the government, he would have found a job straight away, no trouble like he always did, and we'd have been mm. no problems at all. I know that for a fact. Would you ever vote Conservative again? No. 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 Never. That same year, Philip Collins rebelled against his working-class Tory surroundings. I began to think, no, I don't agree with this. So it began, I think, in a, in a sort of teenage rebellion. Then I started to read. It led me to an explicitly liberal position. And it led me into the Labour Party for no better reason than, than I felt a sort of fraternity with the downtrodden. That sounds incredibly pompous. But I felt that the Labour Party was on the side of the vulnerable and the poor in a way that the Conservative Party wasn't. And that was easy to think in 1981. 
Uh, that's really interesting to me because it's almost the exact mirror image of my own experience. I grew up in a working class labour family, but found myself in my late teens leaving home and going from being a theoretical socialist to being a practical and still working class Tory. Back in 1981, my fellow working class Tory Norman Tebbit was in tone at least a long way from the soothing tenor of Edith Pitt back in the 50s. The working class Tory in politics had come to seem like quite a hard edge figure. Community Secretary Eric Pickles, who made his name as a Thatcherite leader of Bradford Council, and Tebbit himself. One, one characteristic is occasionally you have to take risks. You have to be very sure of where you're going. You have to know what you're talking about before you open your mouth. You have to be tougher, you have to be rougher at times, you have to be up earlier in the morning. If you're trying to cultivate the less fertile land, you have to work harder at it. I started in Bradford politics, and Bradford politics is very physical, it's very tough, it's very demanding. You need a thick skin uh, to, see, to see a lot of these things through, and um, people tend to talk less politely uh, to you. It's not Oxford Union debates. Is it because the issues are more severe? You know, it's not just the margin about whether you get your second or third holiday? It's not theoretical. Not That's very true. It's not theoretical. Nevertheless, Thatcher and the Tory working class were a political marriage made in heaven. Many of those fed-up first-time Tory voters clearly did stay with the party. Philip Collins and Saeed Avazi. Mum started voting Conservative when Mrs Thatcher became Prime Minister. And so there was always a split in our family... And, and she voted for Mrs Thatcher because she just, for her, Mrs Thatcher rep represented everything about what she thought Britain would be like and what British women would be like and strong and focused and no, not... You know, she, she really liked the whole package that Mrs T bought. From a Labour point of view, when do you think that the working class Tory was the greatest challenge? In my political memory, it's, it's during the Thatcher years when they had the sort of tapped into a certain section of the working class, which I don't think Labour people had even understood existed, really. That group of people who, when they're given the chance to buy their council house, bit your hand off. And when the Thatcher government just absolutely activated that body of opinion and they went over to her in droves and liked her and liked what she stood for, I think the Labour Party took fright. But did this lead to the creation of a new Tory working class who would stay loyal long term? I think there's a whole class of people who have property and inheritance uh, because of that government who wouldn't otherwise. And that's not to be underestimated because with that comes uh, a sense of freedom. Uh, it gives them money, gives them something to pass on. So I think that was a really major piece of, of change for that. Group of it didn't create a Tory class, did it? No, it didn't. Uh, neither did the privatisations, who briefly created a, a stock-owning democracy, but very briefly. My granddad was amongst them. He bought into every privatisation that was going, so it was a great idea. Got his shares, held on to them for a while, and sold them to an institutional investor, like every prudent uh, small investor would. But that was fine. I think one of her strategies, in a way, towards the working class was, in a sense, to stop people thinking in class terms. I think that one of the mistakes that were made was that if you do that, then the ch chances are that sooner or later people will get fed up with you because they don't have any clear class adhesion to the Conservative Party. I mean, it's very difficult to explain the collapse of the Tory vote in the 1997 election, I mean, which is a huge collapse unless you accept the fact that somehow or other, if people no longer think of themselves as, I don't know, working class or middle class, they don't particularly care where they vote at any particular time. Well, I, I can see two ways you arrive at that. One possibility is that, you know, the Victorian working class Tory actually was conscious of class mm. and approved of it, thought you know, the way the society worked mm. was just fine and that's mm. what we want to keep. Whereas the modern... Conservative working class is maybe the least class conscious person in the country because he doesn't really see class, he just sees opportunity or whatever. So that's one way of thinking of it. The other one could be to take the class interest straight on because the great crash in the Tory polling numbers in the 90s happened after the great negative equity crisis, yes. after the 
the Black Wednesday in 1992, yes, when yes. all those people who'd bought their council homes and then maybe moved on to their next home and geared themselves up suddenly found themselves in desperate straits. Mm. They had done what Margaret Thatcher had encouraged and a Tory government had sort of turned on them. And waiting stage left was Tony Blair. And to middle and lower income Britain, suffering the biggest tax rises in peacetime history, the Tories have betrayed you, but Labour is on your side. Your aspirations are our aspirations. Blair we understood that the working the class point. vote was aspirational more than anything else, didn't it? How did he develop that? He just knew it. He'd grown up with it. He knew it from his dad. His dad was on the list to be a Tory MP before he had a stroke. So he just had it in his family from the start. He, he knew both that people who from humble backgrounds who were Tories weren't sort of lunatics. And he also knew why they were Conservative. They were Conservative because they thought that was the best route up. Now, you were Tony Blair's speechwriter for three years. Did New Labour, under him, push working class voters back to Tories or did it pull them away? At least at first, it pulled almost everybody yeah. towards New Labour. What New Labour at its political height was able to do was construct a coalition of the Labour rock-solid vote with the, the people who wanted to get on. And that goes from the, you know, the aspirant working class and into the, the middle class. So Blair's brilliant ability politically was not to frighten the middle class and signal to people who, who, just, who wanted to do well that, yeah, I, I, I'm with you too. So if New Labour pulled the working-class Tories away from the Tory party, where are we now? The press has characterised the current cabinet as nearly all millionaires. Why should the working class vote for them? I asked one cabinet member who isn't a millionaire, Baroness Vasi. I don't think it's about the people. I actually think it's about the, what we say, how we say, and what our policies are. And if our policies are right for aspirational working-class people, it really doesn't matter who's in charge. OK, tell me about the modern aspirational working-class Tory. The modern aspirational working-class Tory wants to be able to know that at some point they can send their kids to a good school, that they can actually have life opportunities to get, get their kids decent jobs, that when they go to the hospital they have access to decent health care, uh, that they are going to be able to afford to buy their own houses... It's about opportunity. You know, the whole class thing, where in the past it was about which school you went to or which lineage you came from or whether you had a posh title like the Baroness Varsity of Dewsbury. You know, all of that. <laughs> all of that, I think. Is, it's almost ironic, isn't it? All of that is quite... I, I think is, is the kind of old class definition. I think the class definition that I would see is what are the opportunities that are available to you mm. To... You see, but apart from one thing, everything you said, you could equally say, that's why I'm a working-class new Labour member. Yeah, but to me, Labour doesn't represent aspiration. Right. Labour represents a feeling of being happy with the lot that you were born into, with the state helping you to make it more comfortable. Mm -hmm. For me, being Tory means not being prepared to accept the lot that you're being born into and wanting to wa wanting more and having the opportunities well, that's interesting to because, want more. Because, because the, you know, some of the academics looking at the working class Tory vote split it very firmly into two groups. Mm -hmm. One is the aspirational group, which you've talked about all the way through all mm -hmm. this. And the, the other group is the deferential group, those who think, you know, this is my role in society and I should vote for Mr Cameron because he went to a good school uh, and, and all the rest of it and is therefore better equipped to do the job and so on. Is there not a deferential Tory no. vote out there anymore? Well, maybe there is, but it, it, I see I never saw it like that. Yeah. I've never seen it like that. But for... But when you go around the country and you see Tory party members from, from inner cities in the north, don't you find that? I don't, actually. Baroness Vasi is treading the footsteps of Lord Walton 50 years ago, even of Lord Randolph Churchill in the 1880s, trying to bring the workers and the Tories together. So where is the Tory working class today? In as much as it exists, it's to be found, I think, in a lot of the new towns, a lot of those towns that have done extremely well in the 1980s and 1990s, all of which went back to the Conservative Party at the last election. I mean, they're places like Swindon... Milton Keynes, Crawley, Harlow, Stevenage, which Labour hung on to just at the last election, but have all now gone back to the Conservatives. And I think 
they're, they're, the, they're the kind of descendants of the old Tory working class vote. Many of them would not now regard themselves as working class. The history of those towns is often populations that have moved out of an industrial yeah. area, initially moved into a council houses, That's right. bought their council, bought houses, their council houses, and now become workers in light industry um, and, and so on. Small business. Or, small business. Yeah, and who don't feel any particular tie to any particular political party. Perhaps the tribal Tory has become a consumer conservative. So is there really a Tory working class anymore? Lord Tebbit and Saeed Avazi. Well, we are now polling three million less votes in a good year than we used to poll in a good year. And I think the ones we've lost are the ones who we, who no longer recognise us as, as being against the heavy paternalistic hand. Does he have a point? Yes, he does. Uh, he has a point in the sense that there are people who, in the past, and when I say in the past, we're talking when we last had Conservative prime ministers, uh, would have voted for us. Um, and, uh, you know, and I call it, I mean, I, I always define them as the people who bought their council houses under Mrs T, who may not necessarily have voted for us at the last general election. Does it matter? Of course it matters. What are we going to do about it? That's some of the thinking I'm doing now. I have a lot of sympathy for Lord Tebbit's point of view, but I think that the future may be a little more complex. So if the working class Tory is still with us, what does he look like now? She is Saeed Avazi, and he's Eric Pickles. And yes, somewhere out there, he's a young Norman Tebbit too. Today's working class Tories may not have much in common with the temperance-obsessed fans of Randolph Churchill. They might be more similar to Edith Pitt, but the lesson of modern times has been that when it comes to the working class, the party whose turn it is to be aspirational is the one which tends to win their vote. 